uh, uh, so, okay. So uh, uh, we are here in uh, in the, our third se session of the 20, 2022 seminar archives and photograph collections. And today we are receiving Professor Elizabeth Edwards. And I would like to thank you so much for uh, joining us with our discussion. I also want to thank our uh, uh, guests here, uh, and uh, uh, because it's been a, a very, very, uh, very important moment for us. Last year we have uh, uh, nine sessions too of the seminar, and this year we are trying to get around. Uh, our uh, historiographical references. So I was uh, I was just kidding with my friends that we have the queen of photography here, and uh, that's great because we have the jubilee of the queen, and now we have the most important Elizabeth for us here today. So thank <laughs> you again for for your and uh, Marcus, uh, who is co coordinating uh, the seminar with me, will. Uh, uh, present you and uh, I will give them uh, the stage for you. Okay, Elizabeth? So I'm here just to help you. Just say Anna and I, I, I move the slides on. Okay? Yeah, thank you. And in the third session of our seminar, we have a communication from Elizabeth Edwards. Elizabeth Edwards is a visual and history anthropologist. She's a professor emerita of photograph history at the DeMont University. She is also an honorary professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University College London. She has worked extensively on the relationship between photograph, history, and anthropology. Until 2005, she was corrector of photograph at Peach Wright Museum and lecturer in visual anthropology at the Institute of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Oxford, where she is a correct emirate and, and research affiliate. Her monograph and edict works include anthropology and photograph, raw history, phot photograph object history, sensible object, and the camera as historian, a mount photograph and historical imagination, and a lot of, of essay and book, journal, and other publication. We are so grateful for your acceptance in our seminar and collaboration in our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Marcus, and thank you for everyone for inviting me and I'm looking forward to our discussion because um, what I'm talking about is very much work in progress. It's part of a much bigger project on the relationship between photography, or what we now call heritage and public history. Most of the literature positions the development of public history as a post Second World War and emerging largely from the United States and to a lesser extent from Australia. But actually it has a very much longer history and a much more diverse history. And I'm using photograph collections to dig into this complex history. When we think about photograph collections, how they exist in a symbiotic relationship with the way history of photography is written, the tendency has been to focus on museums and galleries, or more recently on archives, particularly disciplinary archives such as, for instance, the colonial institutions of Britain, Portugal, France or Belgium. What has been left out of our historical topographies of, photo of the photographic visibility are the ubiquitous public libraries, founded in many parts of the world, they are structures of education, knowledge, history and citizenship. Their collections of street scenes, postcards of local churches, portraits of local councillors and politicians, photographs of local industries, these have all been seen as merely tedious documents of local history. Yet they have a very rich and interesting history. 
And as some librarians and curators have realized, it was one that could be built on, reinvigorated for contemporary communities as both inspiration and critique. Anna. It is no coincidence that in Birmingham, uh, in the UK, for instance, a number of distinguished practitioners, such as Van Lee Burke, described by Stuart Hall as the grandfather of British, black British photography, which I thought was great until Van Lee and I were comparing notes and discovered we were born in the same year. And I thought we'll have less of this grandfather business. Um, Practitioners such as Van Lee Burke deposited their archives in the public library as a re response to that very status of publicness. I want to say a little about sources here because it underlies everything I'm going to talk about. Because sources for this kind of photographic history are not straightforward. There are relatively few surviving archives about the administration of these libraries. Discussion at the various committees survive only as printed abstracts of local council business in many cases. Further, the librarians, the librarians themselves were not university educated gentlemen of a class that left family or professional papers, but people who rose from humble beginnings to become senior in their field, one of the new professions of the late 19th century. So the daily practices of public libraries have less archival density than one might imagine. The evidence from my account, for my account has been pieced together from the annual reports presented to local government and often sent to other influential libraries such as the Bodleian Library in Oxford or the British Museum as statements of professional modernity. The early professional journals in librarianship have been vital and they need to be understood as primary sources. It is where the voices of these librarians and their commentary on photographs emerge. While one needs to cut through the hyperbole and rhetorical flourish of these accounts, this is where the librarians of all sorts discuss their practices, their ideals and their anxieties. And of course, there are the assemblages of photographs themselves and their material forms. But as I shall discuss, few of these archives survive in their original forms, so they make analysis of these forms very difficult. Conversely, archival disturbance itself is evidence of the serial significances and engagements with these photographs. So methodologically, this paper is about how we piece together a history over a dispersed and often rather silent series of sources. How, how we use photographs and collections as prisms into wider histories. How do we build contexts around a study? Excavating this archival body shows how quasi folk Foucauldian models of power and control and the production of good citizens through institutional procedures what Patrick Joyce has called the work of the techno state, is a very blunt instrument to bring, to bring to such analysis. For we are looking at very complex patterns of agency, institutional practice and centre periphery relations. Also, my argument is very materialist, working outwards from these archives and the, the voices of their makers, rather than from working from an assumed theoretical position. If what follows seems detailed, I hope it is a case study about how we can think about and with archives as a series of historically located deposits. The gathering of photographs in Britain's free public library system begins to emerge in the late 19th and early 20th century. Largely, these photographs were those deemed to be of local interest. This period also saw the emergence of local collections within such libraries and photographs were collected to form a sort of regional and local collective memory within a broad knowledge, knowledge economy within local civic apparatus. These photographs gathered in public libraries were intended to educate their users in the ideas of their history through visual access, through prints, 
photographs and maps to architecture, archaeology, to records of notable local events, to local industry, local customs, and most importantly, create a record of local conditions. Anna? This assemblage provided a strong definition of place expressed through that built environment, industry and landscape. In turn, it defined pe the people and their community. It produced a topography of a, a past firmly rooted in the local. Thus, photographs in libraries were seen first as creating a concrete visual statement of the local, and second, they represented an extended baseline of what was seen as historically important and relevant. Hannah. As some, as such, one might say that they brought history home to locality and made it visible through photographs long before the emergence of the community photographic projects such as those run by many libraries that emerged in the 1970s and beyond and of course it's a very active field now um, that these um, collections and these histories have migrated into digital communities. Just to fill in a little background here on the British public library system, although I think what follows um, has something of the broad shape of what happened in many parts of the world, and I promise you it is short. The free public library system um, funded out of local taxation emerged in the mid 19th century. It was enabled by the 1850 Public Libraries Act. This act empowered local authorities, local governments, to provide free public libraries funded through a small specified percentage of local taxation. And this was in towns and cities with populations of over 10,000 people. Anna? In 1885, this was extended to a slightly greater percentage of overall local taxation and reduced the populations of over 5,000 people. The Public Libraries Act was a permissive legislation in that it enabled but did not compel local governments to become local library providers. However, by the late 19th century, when photography really begins to start moving in public libraries, the and I think the two are related, the publicly funded free library had become a key marker of civilised, liberal and progressive civic identities across the country, from large cities like Birmingham and Manchester, the leaders in the field, to small country market towns. While the adoption of the Act was uneven and focused initially on those large industrial cities which could muster a critical mass of funding under the provisions of the Act, by the late 19th century the spread of free public libraries was rapid. This was especially so after 1893, when legis legislative constraints were relaxed, allowing local government greater freedom to establish libraries. Anna? Local authorities were often supported by benefactions, especially for buildings, notably by the Scottish-American industrialist Andrew Carnegie, or in London and Southern England by newspaper, newspaper proprietor John Passmore Edwards. What these men had in common was a rise from poverty through free access to reading, hence their championship of libraries and working class access. Public libraries were widely promoted as the cultural powerhouse of a town. Culture in the shape of the public library did not just reflect local economic progress, it was also seen to contribute to it. Public libraries were crucial to the strengthening of civic pride. In the words of one librarian from Bolton, an industrial town in northern England in 1913, the public library, he said, should be the centre of the town's educational organisations, an institution from which the rays of culture should radiate, an indispensable factor in the daily life of the people and consequently making it an essential part of the local educational machinery. 
and photographs, I shall argue, became very much part of this. These photographs and the work they were expected to do are, however, almost invisible in history, library history and history of photography. Yet their presence in libraries was of such longevity and extent that local, the, local, the history of local collections in libraries, um, one published in eight, uh, sorry, 1979, stated that, and this is 1979, they're still saying, substantial collections of photographs in local studies departments show these specialist libraries to have visual resources at their centre from their inception. And this is a really important part, from their inception. So the visual was a profound and though often unarticulated part of the culture of the library. For instance, Anna, um, illustrated books, magazines and engravings were widely available. Libraries carried books on photography as well, and some took key journals such as the amateur photographer. It is no co coincidence that amongst the largesse visited on libraries by Andrew Carnegie were, on occasion, sets of stereoscopes, stereoscopic, sorry, stereoscopes and stereoscopic views. Libraries were also, sorry, photographs were also acquired as part of both technical and aesthetic education, especially in larger institutions. Maidstone Museum and Library in Kent, and there was a very strong link between libraries and museums, often physically in the same building at this point, I must point out. Maidstone Museum and Library in Kent, for instance, boasted a collection of photographs of, of works of art for public use. Visual material, especially lantern slides, were was uh, also developed in libraries that developed uh, delivered technical education, often in conjunction with a network of local technical colleges. And these were another manifestation of local in local identity. They were often related to local industries under the and under the terms of the 1889 Technical Instruction Act, one aspect of which supported the acquisition of technical literature and teaching aids, a number of photographs um, of technical processes were acquired by libraries. For instance, in Blackburn in Lancashire, um, centre of the cotton industry, they had a substantial collections on cotton spinning and weaving. In Sunderland, it was shipbuilding. These were all local industries. So photography was very much part, and particularly the lantern slide, was very much part of this technical education in libraries. And as I said, there's hardly any analytical work on these collections at all. And I think a lot of them, particularly the lantern slides, have now disappeared. Um, you know, lantern slides were just an out of date medium for showing out of date um, in industrial technologies by, say, the 1970s or 80s. And I think a lot of them disappeared then. Photographs were thus to be part of the improving economy of knowledge rooted in local identity. To quote a contemporary talking in 1916, the value of adequate photographic records, kept as the common heritage of all, fostering civil spirit, is not to be overlooked. Libraries, as I've said, were spaces of extensive photographic visibility in relation to the local. Anna, photographs were used as instructional de decorative objects. And in this slide, you can see uh, this is Sheffield Public Library in, I think, 1920. And you can see a, there's a row of photographs along the back shelves. You can just see it in the background, middle distance, you can see them. So they were used as instructive um, um, decorative objects on the walls of libraries. For instance, in 1903, one librarian advised hanging on your walls a series of photographs most carefully chosen, but illustrating every phase of local life and activity. Also, I found instances of photographs of local history interest were often um, hung in hallways or on staircases in libraries. So everyone that went up the stairs through the hallway of the library was absorbing um, 
um, photographs of local history as sort of part of the atmosphere of the library. And part of this larger project I'm doing is, is, is looking at that sort of atmospheric absorption of photographs. Um, I'm taking a, absorption from the geographer um, Derek McCormack's work. Uh, he talks about atmospheres and absorptions. And I think this is very important for the way that photographs were working in public libraries, but also in other sort of spaces of, of, of um, uh, public discourse, the street, for instance. I've written about this elsewhere, but I can't go into it here. Anna, um, formal photographic exhibitions um, uh, often generated by overlapping civic networks of local photographic or archaeological societies with the library's local collections were very widespread. This is an example from Norwich and attracted sizable audiences. Often groups of ch school children were brought to see these exhibitions to be educated in their local history. Anna. And local school children were given photographic postcards often of local historical scenes as, histor as um, school attendance awards. And you'll see this one says, never absent, never later. The child's name was written on a form on the back. And I've got very interested in these, and this is going to be part of the larger project. So I've located an important collection of them, but I've been buying them off eBay. They're wonderful. Um, anyway, we digress. Um, Lantern Lectures a staple of visualised knowledge in the library, also often attracted huge audiences. One on the Jewish history of Spain, given at Liverpool Central Library, had, and this was illustrated with lantern slides, had an audience of over 900 people. Above all, there were, as I said, the educational lantern slides shows, which, as a contemporary put it, had the double appeal to the eye and the ear being more effective in conveying instruction to both the educated and the uneducated. Anna. Indeed, the history of photography sometimes featured, um, such as Croydon Library in 1907, they have a lecture on the history of photography. So we see, you know, libraries were photographically saturated places. Anna. Given the emphasis on can we move on, Anne? Thank you. Given the emphasis on civic and local identities, it's unsurprising that the local history collection was the most concentrated site for collecting photographs in public libraries. If history and the national past were seen as represented through the library's book stock, and one of the things I've been looking at is the book stocks of library and the proportion of historical books and the readership for these, Local history also had to be anchored in the local, and this was a very important discourse about how to teach history round about 1900, that you start from the local and you move outwards to the national and the imperial. So making and collecting photographs became increasingly part, important parts of local collections. They offered um, both the power of archival accumulation and a statement of the low the local and they gave access through the immediacy of photographic information. Local collections delivered then a specific forms of knowledge to the public and, and were perceived as a general good. But they also articulated the subjectivities of locale as an act of self-representation and self-assertion. Photography itself was perceived as providing direct and accurate records for local preservation. To, to quote a supporter of visual histories in 1911, the uncompromising and detailed fidelity to the original, which is the outstanding characteristic of a photograph, constitutes a, the great value of photographic record and the most effective means of the reconstruction of the past. So local collections provided both historical immediacy and a concrete sense of the local past within the educative functions of the library available to all. Again, to quote a contemporary, and I'm, I'm using a lot of these um, quotes because I'm very interested in as near as you can get to the contemporary voice about here. Here And this is why I say these library journals must be seen as primary sources. Um, I was once taken up 
by a historian who said, but you're relying on secondary sources. You know, there, as I said at the beginning, there are no big archives. If you want the voice of the librarian, you have to go to their journals and then sort of peel off the layers of rhetoric. And there is a lot of rhetoric. You, you get to recognise it when you work on these things, as we all know. Anyway, um, you, you can... I'm very interested in these voices that come out of the library literature because I, because I come on, out of anthropology. I like to listen to and think with what people have to say about things. Next one, Anna. So as one librarian noted, in, in small provincial towns, everything should be collected within reason, which in any way, anything which in any way illustrates or illuminates local history, habits, manners, amusements, social or material progress. And I think photography was absolutely crucial in this connection because it's because increasingly its inclusive inscriptive nature was effectively expanding the inscription of the past in the present for the future. The expansion of local collections and photographic collection coincides with a clear sense of distinctiveness that defined and legitimated local authorities who provided libraries. Provincial towns and cities, especially at this period, experienced an enhanced sense of the local in relation to those of empire and nation. There was a fierce local patriotism. In context, then, the period up to the end of the First World War. In this period, the creation of special local collections was very common. To quote, practically every library of any size made one of its first tasks to build up a local history collection, which often included prints and photographs, as well as books, pamphlets and manuscripts. So we could say that an understanding of the past for the benefit of the future was at the centre of the library consciousness and practice, including its photographic engagement. As one librarian put it, and very typically for 1903, to become effective as workshops, libraries must enable the student to start from local history, from local geography, from local geology from every resource of local knowledge. Library descriptions in the Gazetteer section of the li library's yearbook are very revealing. I tell you, I read some extraordinarily obscure things in this project. The range and extent of libraries um, who make, sorry, the range and extent of libraries who make local co collections a feature of their identity as they list themselves in this library's yearbook is very significant. Some note the presence of prints, pictorial matter, topographical views, or specifically photographs. This self-identification of and with the presence of visual material and indeed local collections probably represents only a very small proportion of the holdings of photographs in public libraries. Interestingly, local collections and their visual components begin to drop off the Gazetteer listings by 1914. One can conjecture that by this date, local collections and indeed photographs within libraries were so commonplace that they were no longer perceived as identifying characteristics. They were simply absorbed into the everyday being of the library. So photographs start entering library collections almost unnoticed. This is where the excavation gets very difficult. They are sel seldom commented on, but they are clearly there. One catches sight of them in annual reports, in chance remarks and short notes in library and photographic journals. Local collections were largely dependent on local networks of association and dissemination and the flow of local historical knowledge within the community in order to produce coherent visualizations of the past. There was a strong sense of what I can only call sort of gathering in. The local collection was grounded particularly in local knowledge, privileging places or sites that defined the experienced, the imagined and the performance of the local. 
Some libraries had very intentional collecting policies, for instance, Birmingham, Croydon, the Guildhall Library in London, Norwich or Cardiff. In Cardiff, um, they developed a very extensive collection of photographs of what they called local objects. And this was in place by 1900. Next one, please. Mr. Cappell Shaw, uh, Birmingham librarian, referred to the survey photographs like this one, more of them in a minute. Um, he, he referred to the survey photographs held in the local collection there being, and I quote, of incalculable value. It was one of the most unique and probably useful collections, he said. And in the annual report of that library for 1898-9, he notes that the title list for the Warwickshire Photographic Survey images was, and I quote, one of the most used books in the reference library. However, for the most part, the ghostly presence of what are clearly substantial numbers of photographs means that pattern, patterns of acquisition and thus institutionalization remain frustratingly opaque. Many collections depended on networks of historical and photographic production and circulation. They built up um, their collections from donations from local historians and antiquarians. Certainly photographs and illustrated materials were widespread within these acquisitions, but only occasionally itemised. Anna, um, for instance, um, in 1906 and 7, the Gloucester Free Library reported a donation of, a, and here's one of them, a series of enlar 21 enlarged photographs of Gloucestershire fonts and timpana for the photographic record. And these are absolutely gorgeous carbon prints that's been made by the photographer, who was a local commercial photographer. Few libraries appear to have purchased photographs for local collections, despite uh, local commercial photographers producing a, a, a mass of views of potentially historical interest. Although many of these photographs have found their way into local libraries since. They don't seem to have been collected very much at the time, and it seems to have been simply a matter of money. There was some confusion about the legality of acquiring photographs and other visual material from the library tax, reflecting perhaps an uncertain status of photographs within largely bibliographic collections. Despite enthusiastic and vocal supporters amongst librarians, the emphasis given to visual collection and indeed local collections was very, very variable. In many cases, it was dependent on the personal, bibliographic and indeed political tastes of the librarian. Anna. The success of Brentford's modest local library, Brentford is now um, a suburb of West London, you've probably flown over it many times on the way into Heathrow. Um, Brentford's modest public library, for instance, this collection was due to its librarian, Mr Turner, being very interested in local history. He actively built up a photographic collection and he placed it in albums in the reference library. Its, its progress noted through his annual reports. And they deny all knowledge of this collection now. It's one of these ones that's been split up and uh, dispersed. Yet other collections were entirely random and it's clear that librarians were simply not interested. There remained, however, within ideas of local distinctiveness that I noted earlier, the problems of the parameters of the local collection, what it should contain and for whom. James Duff Brown, librarian of Clerkenwell in East London and a prolific writer on, of library manuals, stated in 1903, that while, and I quote, photographs of every notable building, street, person or event in the district were desirable, at the same time it was better to let the local collection grow naturally than attempt to force it into prominence all at once. 
unless some private collector's treasures be acquired by gift or purchase with which to make a start. He goes on, no local collection should be fostered at the expense of the general work of the library. Some librarians with antiquarian tastes, Mr Turner in Brentford perhaps, occasionally do this in districts rich in historical and archaeological associations. And this is undoubtedly to the prejudice of the eff efficacy of the general library. So there's a, quite a pushback against this. Some librarians, while broadly supporting the idea of the local collection, were concerned that local enthusiasms might therefore be allowed to siphon off a disproportionate amount of library funding, which would be better spent on the library's main purpose. This was especially so in smaller libraries, where there was a concern that photographic acquisition might deflect funds from the library's central purpose, which was books and education. Anna? At one level, a large city like Birmingham was successful because it was big enough to sustain both. So was Manchester. However, for some librarians, even local collections themselves were seen as problematic. Anna. They were seen as hotbeds of unprogressive and self-indulgent antiquarianism. There was also some debate as to their appropriateness to free libraries, because the, the um, free libraries had largely a lower middle class and working class demographic in their users. Whose history was this actually? However, as I've suggested, there appears conversely to be a view that photography with its random inclusiveness and scales of inscription, its immediacy and appeal to the eye had, potential, had the potential to form some sort of counter narrative that might mitigate such antiquarian effects. Anna, librarians intent on more systematic and bibliographically robust engagement with local recording and acquisition of photographs turn to the networks of civil action, civic action, sorry. Collaboration with local camera clubs and societies in the form of photographic survey, and some of you may know I've written a lot about this, offered a conceptual and pra practical sense of completeness in historical statement. As a librarian in 1911 noted, arrangements should be made with local photographers or if there is an amateur or uh, if there is an amateur on the library staff who possesses and knows how to use a camera, good prints should be obtained of all local events, such as the declaration of the king with military and civic ceremony or the unveiling of a monument. Under the rubric of this largely amateur movement, local clubs and amateur photographers deposited their photographs um, of the material re remains of the local pasts in the library for the general good. Importantly, these actions were understood as donations of photographic skill within the local social exchange networks. As a, as a letter to the Library Association record, it's a key journal in the library field, noted. Photographic survey and record may be defined as the organised enlistment in the public service of a unique, the unique power of the camera. Thus, local communities were encouraged to document themselves for the benefit of all. And I quote again, in the photographs daily taken by the thousand by amateur and professional photographers, there actually exists material with public potential value hardly to be overestimated. Indeed, it goes on, the results of such a survey can be of the greatest value to all citizens who wish to know more about the conditions of their own area. And it is this position that in many ways, Anna, lays the foundations for what, um, for the idea of, the li of library involvement with community projects in the late 20th and 21st century. It also raises, I think, 
questions about the grounds for selection um, of these visual histories, given the class demographics and the ability um, to indulge in photography as a hobby. At one level, fo the photographic surveys reproduce traditional patterns of hierarchical importance. The parish church, the big house, the almshouses for the poor, the village green, the charitable foundation, ancient trees, local curios. These are all the foci of antiquarian interests since at least the 18th century, which had also shaped many textual donations to local histories. However, these familiar patterns are not the only historical narratives being generated and institutionalized. Um, Anna, in constituting important in local terms, such collections also gave popular culture a tradition which reached back into the past of the nation. It, but it's a national past conceived in terms of specific identities and a local and regional culture. This was arguably strategically reinforced by the inclusiveness of photographic inscription as a historical record. The directness of photographs as information was seen as especially efficacious in working class education, and the inclusiveness of photographic inscription was seen as holding a range of historical possibilities and experiences. And I quote, a pictorial record of the state of things physical and general, now existing. Photographs with their inscriptions of streets and schools and markets and workplaces, as well as churches and antiquity, expanded the potential historical record into the infrastructures and landscapes of experience, which were simultaneously local, historical and modern. This sense of civic modernity is reflected perhaps uh, in the fact that the impetus for local survey was often driven by local authorities and libraries themselves, not by photographers saturated in picturesque traditions. Anna, in Birmingham, increasing numbers of photographs in address the industrial and urban histories and infrastructures, such as this photograph of the central fruit and vegetable market. You find similar um, patterns in Manchester and Norwich, um, Anna. In Norwich, for instance, the local survey, which included this photograph of um, footwear factories, uh, Norwich was a centre of a big agricultural area with a lot of cattle grazing. So the um, buy industries are a lot of leather industries um, focused um, in Norwich, so hence the importance of the shoe industry. So the impetus for local survey in Norwich was clearly driven by the library and it, it was the library that produced the organising committee that was made up primarily of librarians, but also local networks, which included the Scientific Gossip Club, Norwich Teachers Field Club, the Ladies Camera Club, and the local Photographic Society. Anna, in Dundee, Keithley and Rotherham in Yorkshire and Exeter in the West Country, for instance, the photographic survey was effectively commissioned from from local photographic societies by the local authority. It was the local authority that were in the driving seat and they were commissioned specifically for deposit in their libraries where they could be absorbed and translated into a wider currency of local efficacy. And with all these surveys, the modern is as important as the historical and, and the way the photographic surveys have been written about, it's, it's as if they're a sort of middle class colon, colonially driven nostalgic wallow. They're not entirely, that is completely to misrepresent them. Dundee in Scotland, I think, is a very interesting case here about questions of modernity and efficacy, because it raises those very questions that I've been talking about, and above all, a sense of the future. 
that the photographic archive would achieve would communicate these community values into the future anna the dundee Sur photographic survey was instigated and i'm sorry this is a terrible snapshot on my iphone in the archive um was instigated in 1903 and then revived in 1916 by the local authority in conjunction with local networks of industry and amateur and professional photographic production. It aimed to respond to the call for photographic survey as, and I quote, a pictorial record of the state of things, physical and general, now existing. It didn't specify what things were, so consequently, the, phot the photographs recorded not only, as I've just been saying, the old historical buildings of Dundee, but factories, housing, industry and labour as now existing. Anna. However, the Dundee survey was not only to provide a record of, to quote, the civic life of the borough in the early years of the 20th century, it's how they positioned themselves. It anticipated the desire for a memory of civic, of current or contemporary civic and industrial efficacy, an identity in the future. Printed largely in the stable processes of platinum and carbon, the albums became a sort of time capsule within the structures of local governance and information provision. And I quote, one set of the photographs is to be sealed up and deposited in the Dundee Charter Room. It's a sort of strong room where they kept their civic papers, the Dundee Charter Room, to be opened, say, a, a, sorry, a century hence. And it's to be kept in, the other one is to be kept in the public reference library to be consulted under conditions that will ensure its preservation. So you've got this sense of the survey and its albums becoming a kind of time capsule. It's driven not only by a sense of the past, but a sense of contemporary civic pride. For instance, the newest machinery in the factories as a competitive modernity. And it's driven by an anticipation of the future. Factory owners in particular seem to have commissioned local photographers to produce their statements of modernity within the structure of the survey. And it's a modernity, of course, inscribed through the modernities of photographic technologies. And there is a, there's a lot of commentary about how photography itself is the appropriate technology to record these technologies of modernity. It's sort of this, this sort of Russian doll of technologies of modernity that they talk about the whole time. It's a very strong theme. The Dundee survey received its impetus equally from local institutions of knowledge, the library and the museum. And as we can see, it's moving through the networks of civic society manifested through photographs. It made civic society visible and accessible to all through the inscription of local things here lodged in the library. Next one, please, Anna. And this um, cultural self-definition de and community definition has continued with a photographic exercise undertaken in 1991 and as recently as 1917. And they, the, these in Dundee and in other places too, these collections become, become sort of additive archival spaces that go right back into the late 19th, early 20th century, but they're still perceived as active in communities now. And Dundee, as you see here, is a very, very good example of this. While relationships with photographic survey varied locally, many libraries took an overt future orientated work, uh, view of their work in, the, in of, sorry, future orientated work of their local collections. Um, and, you know, Dundee is a very good example. Indeed, there's a sort of evangelical language one finds around the civic role of libraries at this time. And it's very interesting because exactly the same language as evangelical language is, 
is also used of photography around the survey movement. So they're very using a very, very similar language about social and economic benefit, about education and accessibility, and above all, about the future and future citizens. So there's a mapping on of the language between photography and libraries, which I think is very interesting. An example of this interconnection, Anna, is when Exeter, a cathedral city in the southwest of England, inaugurated its photographic survey in conjunction with the library in 1911. It's one of these instances where the library effectively commission a, a visual survey for their library. When they started this, um, sort of the launch meeting, if you like, um, they invited the influential sociologist and urban planner Patrick Geddes to give a lecture, which he did in front of, if we understand it correctly, a packed audience in the town hall. His lecture was entitled Cathedral Cities, Past, Present and Possible. In it, he argued that the growth of urban infrastructure, such as libraries where the survey and other photographs were, be, were to be deposited, were integral to concepts of the general good and well-being of future generations. Anna. Such events were reinforced by the entanglement of the photographic archive, not only with displays of civic efficacy, but with networks of social reform and education for which the interface between photography and expressions of, of the local contributed. It was to be an intensely liberal, democratic and optimistic project. Char and it's one that sort of is characteristic of late 19th century social welfareist liberalism. In order to deliver the overall aspiration of local, the local and the photographic, the expansion of free libraries was accompanied by an, by an increasing professionalization of their management procedures and staffing. This professionalization spawned, spawned a huge technical literature in the form of manuals, journals, as we've seen and so forth. And in this, again, we find the ghostly traces of photographic practices and the material mechanisms through which the values of the library and its photographs were made useful. So I'm just as I come to the end, I'm going to look very briefly at the ways in which photographs were managed, because library practices translated scattered photographic traces into an archive of systematized historical information and definition of local identity. And I think those of us working in photographic archives should always give more thought than we do, probably, to the conditions of photographic management at given historical moments, because they're extremely revealing in, in my experience. Anna. Usually local collections and thus their photographs were part of reference collections or in larger libraries, as they are now, special collections. And they were subject, therefore, to the specific regulation of reference libraries or special libraries. As librarian Stanley Jast put it in 1913, uh, 1939, he became he came from very humble immigrant background and rose to be librarian of the great Manchester City Library. These spaces, he said, enshrined both the past and the present, but energized the future. To the mind which is alert to an opportunity, a stimulant to be taken up, a powerhouse, they are not a grave. The challenge for librarians was to ensure accessibility and visibility within the ethos and practices of both the library and the local. Links with photographic survey not only put the acquisition of photographs on a more systematic footing, but brought it in within the technical expertise of bibliographic management. Anna. It's difficult to excavate patterns of archival acquisition, um, as I've said, so it's equally difficult to excavate patterns of management and use. 
Few libraries concerned themselves with the provenance and history of the photographs beyond what it was of and sometimes who took it. They were, in their own minds, dealing with little bits of information. How to arrange and classify and store photographs, get short, get short entries in li library manuals and annual reports. And photographic donations, as I've said, are sometimes listed in annual reports. But in particular, collections have been subjected to constant rearrangement to suit the perceived demands of both developing library librarianship within local collections and, on the other hand, the shifting desires of library users themselves. Particularly significant is the way in which access to knowledge took on new in a new embodiment in open access libraries. Anna, next one, please. We take open access libraries for granted now. Uh, we can walk into a library and pick up a book. And open access, I should add, yes, they did use that very term. It is not a child of the digital age. They did. Open access libraries only appeared in Britain in the 1890s. They were a bit earlier in the United States. And they, they, they met with um, considerable opposition. This is what they thought would happen to libraries if the, if the working class public were allowed loose in libraries. Of course, it didn't happen. And all libraries report their book losses and they are minimal, minimal. Um, many librarians who did much to build local collections and facilitate photographic collection were also li reforming librarians and early exponents and adopters of open access libraries. You know, it's a very big political debate about letting the working class uh, loose on books. It's a huge debate and it's a very interesting one. I think this alignment between the building and facilitating of local and photographic collecting and open access libraries is a very important one. It suggests an intimate relationship between photographs and democratic flows of knowledge. For these reforming librarians, there was no doubt about the civic, civic and educational importance of local collections and photographs. For instance, in Nor Norwich City Library, George Stevens saw its local history and visual collections as one of its strengths, and he was an adamant supporter of open access libraries and introduced them in, in Norwich. A similar position was at Worcester, where the librarian Mr Duckworth was acquiring photographic material and described the local history collection and presumably its extensive holding of photographs as the main attraction of the library for many. Indeed, arguably, the custodial ro role of the public library was epitomised by its local history department, which stressed a respect for the en endeavours of citizen ancestors. And that was Mr Duckworth speaking there. And again, he was very, very active in the early adoption of open access libraries. If it is difficult to retrieve the voices of librarians and modes of arrangement, a sense of the users is even more difficult. And as we all know, uh, reception studies um, is, is a very fraught historical field. Although some libraries break down their registered readers by occupation, photographic usage figures are often rolled in with those of the reference library. So we don't know how many people were looking at photographs or how many were simply checking the racing results or looking for a job in the local newspaper. It's all rolled into one. We just don't know. However, the numbers involved as a proportion of population suggest a wide demographic usage. Uh, next one, please, Anna. Comments suggest at least a steady usage of photographs. And although one cannot be sure how typical such a figure is, the annual report for Croydon Library in 1907 
states that some 7,477 readers used the 2,500 photographs of the survey of Surrey in their reference library. I Just on sheer numbers, I find it hard to believe they're all middle-class architects building houses in the Surrey Hills. Uh, th there has to be a, a wider demographic at work. And Kate Hill makes this very argument about the usage of museums um, at the similar period, that the demographics suggest there must have been a strong working class usage, but they, they are lost within the figures. Next one, please, Anna. The optimum management of um, photographic collections is most uh, fully laid out in this publication of, of 1916, The Camera's Historian, and my volume of that name is very much a tribute volume to this wonderful book. This was a guide to photographic uh, survey practices, and it articulates a con clear concern with the management of photographs in their albums, filing cabinets and boxes, which structured the ways in which photographs were encountered in the library and of course, the forms that facilitated their civic work. Such everyday material practices constituted the site where the values and ethos of the library and its practices become visible. This book set the standard for library practices in relation to photographs and local history. Though published, as I said, in 1916, it was still being recommended in manuals of li local collection librarianship as late as the early 1960s. The growing focus on the management of photographs points to the increasing scale and demand um, to bring expertise, order and the delivery of useful and improving knowledge. It, 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 it points to the importance of that institutionalization of photographs as local potential. Throughout these debates is a sense that to have photographs is to be able to engage, sorry, to have photographs, to be able to engage with photographs creates a sense of strong history and belonging. If photography has been central to many wider agendas around community histories and civic society in the late 20th and early 20th centuries, it has its roots in the early 20th. 20th century optimistic view of local collections and what photography and photographs could deliver. Next one, please, Anna. It is no coincidence that it was library collections that were at the forefront of publishing books of old photographs, such as these ones here, to which the historian Raphael Samuel pointed in his Theatres of Memory. The entangled resurrection, that is, of photographs and historical imagination. The inclusive desires and potentials placed photographs, of act, uh, photographs as active agents in building a better and more understanding society. Anna? For instance, community projects such as that at Birmingham uh, City Library called Connecting Communities, this is an ongoing photographically driven project. Similar at a, a smaller scale, next one please Anna, um, we see local history exhibitions out in the open air where anyone can see them that are pushing library collections into the public space, making local histories visible. They are, and of course, these sorts of collections and projects are now um, May, they're, they're now in very dynamic um, virtual spaces online. So as I say, all these agendas are now widespread and vibrant in both analog and virtual forms. All represent a series of linked agendas with photography at their very center, but one, as I've said, that has its roots in the hopefulness that clustered around photography in the early 20th century. Final one, please, Anna. So 
while we contemplate the future of photographs and the nature of the archives and what we might do with them, I think a backward, the backward glance that I provided suggests the longevity of expectation about what photographs might do for communities more broadly. Technologies have changed, of course, ways of making have changed, patterns of institutionalization have changed, even ideas of authorship and significance have changed irrevocably. But the social and cultural desires for what photographs can do for people, how they can mark their histories in multiple ways, give expression to concerns and frustrations, negotiate a sense of the, the local, yet reach out to the national, and indeed international. None of this has changed, for these are the basic desires of what people want photographs and photography, photography to do for them. Yet, as I said at the beginning, these archives sitting in public libraries across, across Britain and elsewhere are seldom subjects of analysis in and of themselves. They lie outside the value system of important photography. But then again, I've always believed in the fundamental and transformative energy of the margins. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I propose uh, before uh, we go to our discussion, a five minutes break, just a five minutes to, to drink some water and uh, and uh, we can if we were in the live we have some refreshments and coffee but uh, let's be online i cannot serve you some refreshments and coffee so, uh, in five minutes we are back okay yeah. yes thank you everyone because i know it's tiring listening <laughs> yeah interested to see what people have to say actually <laughs> Looking at Mark. Really excited about about your presentation. It's 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 a it's a first hand presentation, and I think uh, we have so many things to think about. And I have mm. our guests here. They are, they are coming back. Elizabeth, your your camera is closed. Uh, yes, yeah, okay. there we are. Okay. okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, Marcus is going. Uh, uh, to get again the coordination of the the mm -hmm. the, the session and i think uh, uh it is yeah i think we okay. can, we can start again for, with uh luciana marcus okay 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 uh, okay, okay. Uh, today we have three guests who will talk with us about the reflections made by elizabeth Abbott. there are three professors Luciana Martins, Marcos Lopes, and Paulo Pinaus. I think it's better to start with Luciana. Luciana is a professor um, professor of Latin America and Visual Culture at Bilberg University of London. And last year, uh, she was with us in this seminar. Uh, thank you, Luciana, to your presence today. Thank you, Marcos and, and Anna, and thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, it's an amazing uh, talk. Um, I'm going to look at my title library with new eyes now. <laughs> <laughs> really, <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah, I, I, I particularly um, liked the, the um, when you talked about uh, the modernity of the medium itself and uh, you know the 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 the, the idea of uh, creating these collections as uh, you know as a sign of uh, when you use this expression of a, a time capsule mm -hmm. so you know this idea of um, uh, making an effort to register things that uh, they know is going to change Mm -hmm. um so so it's is this um it is not uh nos just nostalgic for this uh, more antiquarian uh idea of history but it's it's this idea of of um recording the modernity that they know it's going to pass in a way you know because the the you see you see those those factories and uh 
which, which is, which, you know, it, it, it's a different sense of history, I think, that's being created through those uh, efforts of, of collecting at that period. Uh, so I think that's something that I, I'd like you to, to say something more about. I have another, um, another um, aspect of your talk um, that um, when, when you mentioned the book, you know, the camera as historian, um, I was thinking maybe the camera as a kind of a historical geographer, uh, mm -hmm. because it's very much uh, linked with uh, the making of these places um, as well, isn't it, of these of this communities, but they are related to particular um, senses of place. Um, and, and, and so th th these, um, uh, the idea of the local, I think the idea of the scale it's very important that here in your talk, I, I, I mm -hmm. sense, but yeah. I, I think you don't uh, develop very much that uh, mm -hmm. in, in your talk because you, you mentioned you know, the, 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 the scale of the local, the national and imperial. And I think the imperial at this moment is, is key, I think, for understanding mm -hmm. this, uh, this uh, attachment to the local in a way, you know, because mm -hmm. this is a period of incredible um a change in terms of expansion of empire um mm -hmm. and and expansion of of um uh, limits as well and so, so i think you know as, as you see these new places being 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 uh, becoming part of you know the, the british empire what, what i feel with these with these lo local pictures when i see them is it is a kind of um, anxiety in a way, anxiety of, of loss, of, of loss of something, you know, that is, uh, that, that is manageable. Um, so I don't know if there's a kind of a, a collective unconscious, you know, of, 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 being, uh, of, of being afraid of, of, of this expansion uh, and this meeting with, with the others of the, of the empire and this, this uh, kind of, uh, sense of 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 uh security that the the enclosure in in a kind of in, in a local community brings um so i, I just wanted to you know if, if you could expand a little bit more as well on on the on the connections between those scales um mm -hmm. you know the local and the national and the, the imperial um as well um yeah and uh, another uh just brief comment that I like to, to do is in, in, in relation of the kind of open access, because I think the open access was, was a, a, an anxiety as well uh, about the creation of this, of the citizen, isn't it, of the working class becoming, uh, yeah. I think it, it happened with Botanic Gardens as well. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the idea yeah. that, you know, you, you open the Botanic Garden and, the, you know, it's going to destroy it, you know, so, so people have access to that. So, I, I mean, there's something about behavior mm -hmm. uh, being, being constructed there as well, isn't it? Uh, to, you know, you, you are a citizen if you don't, you know, nick the book from the library. So you, you have, even, even the, the cartoon is already a way of disciplining, um, mm -hmm isn't it because you, you'll be ridiculed if, if you do that so it, so there, there's a kind of, of, of mirror uh, working there mm -hmm. um, so yeah just there's a point about um, this, this different um, uh, this, this different uh, spaces where this disciplining is, is, is happening and, 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 and the role of, of uh, you know, this photographic collections and surveys uh, in, within mm. as well. I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. That's, uh... Thank you, Luciana. That's enormously rich. And um, you, you've, you've raised some really important points that I have been thinking about, actually, but they weren't in the paper. Um, sort of, I think your sort of first point about uh, mediums of modernity and change and uh, imperial anxiety kind of morph into one another. I think there's sort of part of the different angles on the same thing. Um, I think that I think that this idea of a modernity that was going to disappear is certainly part part of this discourse about the future. And what's really interesting is 
just to give an example, there's there's a I didn't talk about it at all. Um, there's a very interesting photographic survey in Keithley, a textile town in Yorkshire, or ex textile town, we should say now. And they actually make a point of recording, if you like, disappearing modernities. Um, and it's a very interesting survey. It's not a big one. It's quite small. It survives in four enormous volumes about this size um, in the public library. No one's done anything with it, fortunately. It's still in its, um, it's still in its original form. It's one of the few that is. And it was it's really interesting because it's an additive space over about 40 years from the late 1890s. And it finishes in about 1936. I think that's the most recent images. And so these four albums in the library become an additive space of this shifting modernity. And one of the things they record within this are old factories that are being modernized. So when electric pumps come in, for instance, they photograph the remains of the old water pumps being taken out. Um, a lot of surveys have um, a photograph of the last horse-drawn tram and then the new electric tram coming in. So there's this sense of of rolling modernities that define it. So it's a sense of loss, but it's also very future orientated. Um, so I think there is this, this, this play of time within the surveys, which is really interesting. Um, there's always this anticipated memory that's at work, which of course is true of most photography in some way or other. Um, I think you're absolutely right. This is Cameron's historical geographer. There's no doubt about it. And again, the Keithley one is really very interesting. Um, there's a very controversial um, reservoir built in the, I think, around about 1930, up in the Pennine Hills above the town. And this is to feed water supply into the huge industrial cities of West Yorkshire. And it floods a very beautiful valley. And, you know, I think it's accepted local as a cruel, locally as a cruel necessity. But what happens is in that these are the only sort of picturesque photographs in the whole of the Keithley survey. The, the photographers go out and they take these beautiful lyrical photographs of the valley that is going to be flooded for a reservoir. So you do get a very intense sense of loss but also there's the excitement of the modernity and there's a lot of photographs of the civil engineering and then there's um, a photograph of the Duke of Devonshire opening it and so the local aristocracy and don't be misled by the word Devonshire, they own all the northern coal fields, that's why they're so rich, still are. And, um, and, and so there is this sense of modernity rolling modernity but also a very intense sense of loss and it's so interesting that it's the picturesque style of photography that kicks in at that moment you know gnarled trees covered in moss the light falling in a certain way it's very pretty um so there is that sense but so they do become sort of historical geographers that are defining locality and shifts in locality and i think what's underneath this is uh, an enormous uh, debate about what it is to be local. Um, there's been an enormous amount of work by historical geographers, which you well know, and also by urban historians um, about shifts in ideas of modernity and community. There's some very interesting work on civic ritual um, in the late 19th century and what this actually means because it's civic ritual which is photographed for the local library um, you know the, the, the unveilings of statues and the Lord Mayor in his outfit regalia um, and there's this very strong sense of this that is being played out in relation to local manifestations of a much larger ceremonial of political power like the imperial Durbas in India. 
um, and the Queen Victoria's Jubilees and the increasingly um, expensive royal coronations. And we've just had a weekend of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. No expense spared. Um, so, you know, this is a continuing tradition. Um, and, you know, local libraries are now encouraging people to send in their, their little iPhone videos of what they did on the Platinum Jubilee weekend. It's an ongoing process of past becoming, uh, the, the present becoming past. It's this endless temporal slippage, which is in these collections. Your question about imperialism and was this an anxiety against um, uh, loss of identity in relation to imperial expansion? It's very difficult to know. It's if you like, I don't know if this translates, but it's it's the, the elephant in the room. It's something that's huge and there, but you can't see. They never talk about it in all my sources that I've used, both for the cameras historian and this more recent project. It, it's never talked about, but you know it's there. And of course, the colonial networks are absolutely everywhere. I mean, if you look at a photographic survey or the photographic collection of Manchester City li Library and their photographs of cotton warehouses and cotton mills and you know, the, the, the bond warehouses for the te printed textiles going back out to Africa and India, uh, it's completely colonially saturated, but it's never articulated. I don't get a sense that this is um, a sense of anxiety. The anxiety, I think, if, if you can sense it, is much more between the local and the national. This is a historical period when the, you know, through various political acts of parliament, there is a much, much greater emphasis on the central state. And it's how regional identities, local identities and political power is negotiated against the central state. And that, I think, is a much greater driver than the imperial. But you're absolutely right, it is saturated with the imperial. I mean, Dundee was a whaling port. They were coming in through the north of Scotland and you know, they made corsets there because they had the whalebone. It, you know, it, it, it just saturates everything. Um, when I, I, I used when I used to teach this, you might be interested as a footnote. I used to put up a photograph of Blackburn in Lancashire, which was another of these it, satellite satellite towns, cities for Manchester, huge, ugh, huge area just given over to the tech, cotton textile industry. And I used to show a photograph of the steaming chimneys, you know, the, the smoking chimneys of the textile mills of Blackburn. And it's it's like the beginnings or the old beginnings of a very popular soap opera in Britain, Coronation Street, which is set in the Northwest. And you get this sort of nostalgic music over this image of the smoking chimneys of the textile mills. Um, and I used, to, I used to say to my students, here's Blackburn, is it? Is this an imperial landscape? And they used to say, no, it's, it's Blackburn. You say, yeah, it is an imperial landscape because every single one of those chimneys is premised on, on cotton coming in from the colonies. And much of it on recently um, liberated enslaved labor in, in the Caribbean and, and the United States. I mean, most of these factories weren't really around until the 1840s. In, but, but you know, the and you know, Lancashire workers were going out on strike in sympathy with cotton workers, largely black cotton workers in the United States, and, and so forth. It was it's a very very complex, and so of course it's there, but it's never articulated in these. Um, and the only the only time you see it articulated, literally articulated, is that um, in a lot of the military parades around the Boer War, the um, 
the uh, jubilees and coronations and then later the, the end of the first world war is that you would get battalions of um, imperial troops who would be part of the march past and that would you know that connection was there um but again it's 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 not visible but it's there it's saturating everything i don't know i, I could go on about this for a very long time because um it's something that i i'm very interested in about um you know the, the pr to what extent was this an imperially saturated consciousness or was it not i mean one one who wrote that book the absent-minded imperialists mm -hmm. um, who, who who did it uh, he was a professor at newcastle yeah, yeah. i can't remember the name of the author but it, it, it was you know this argument that actually unless you be belong to a certain um, class, uh, mm. largely an upper middle class strata, who are actually running the empire, it didn't make an awful lot of day to day impact on you. Yeah, I, I was just uh, wondering, um, you know, because there were lots of, uh, you know, people who, who, who went to, you know, to the outposts of empire. Yeah. Um, that weren't upper class, uh, mm. that were they went for to work there. Yeah. So, you know, there might be a way of um, exploring, I don't know, maybe some uh, kind of personal archives, family archives, where you might see, you know, exchanges of those photographs, um, you know, to give a sense of, mm. uh, you know, connection to the place that were left in the colonies you know i don't know and I'm, I'm just kind of um thinking aloud but you know uh, uh, there must there must be a way of 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 uh, tracing a bit a bit you know uh of of uh, some of those uh histories that that it might uh, help to to provide uh some clues for that that feeling but uh thank you thank you so much i mean just to come back quickly on that i think there probably are i mean i think a number of archives and interestingly there are a number of local archives who hold if you like colonial photograph albums from local families who were in india or wherever and but it's interesting those tend not to go to the local history library but they tend to go to the local archives so there's quite an interesting demarcation about where photographs go and actually one of the things i said i didn't talk about this a lot but um one of the things that's happened probably almost in the last 20 or 30 years is that with the rise of the consciousness about the importance of historical photographs and also the problems of their archival preservation that they they're delicate and they need help that a number of libraries and indeed museums have actually sent their photographs to the local archive office and the period I'm looking at actually predates the establishment of local county record offices which is the 1926 archives act I think so a lot of what local history libraries were doing up to 1920 say local archive offices premised on the idea of the original manuscript etc um they begin to move into that space and so the shape of local history libraries changes a little bit and so most of them held on to their photographs but they transferred manuscripts that they might have held but they held on to their photographs but then with the rise and rise of old photographs and historical photographs and consciousness of their conservation needs a number of lo local libraries have now moved those over to archive offices as well so they're no longer Croydon's an example where I work um, they're no longer in the libraries that they were intended for and often this is happening completely without documentation so you know in 50 years time there'll be a very tenuous link that these were ever in the library and the number of libraries that have denied that they have photographic collections to me is enormous till you turn up there and say what's that oh it's a photograph yeah well that's what i'm after oh we thought you meant art no <laughs>
<laughs> Sorry, I went down that route. <laughs> thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Uh, the next debate is Paulo Knaus, is a professor in the Department of, of History in Universidade Federal Fluminense. Paulo. Hi, Paulo. Thank you, Marco. First, I would like to thank uh, Professor Edwards for the wonderful paper. Uh, it was really very interesting to hear you. Uh, and. Uh, I was very glad about the the approach you chose to develop your argument, uh, especially because you highlighted those uh, heritage practices. Uh, now, especially when you were answering Luciana Martins, uh, you were also highlighting this, how 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 these heritage practices uh, keep uh, renewing along the time because of the conservation. Uh, issues, and uh, this was something I wanted to ask you about. But first, uh, let me uh, say that I, I, I think your talk was especially interesting for our research group because you started uh, talking about uh, uh, public history and uh, uh, um, how the practices, uh, those historical practices, uh, have a, a long history. Uh, in fact, uh, you you gave us a wonderful um, uh, example uh, of how uh, this uh, practices has a, a long history. But I wouldn't say that uh, the practice of uh, thinking about these practices and putting them and uh, not just uh, documented it, uh, not just uh, uh, knowing about the practice, but also thinking critically about these practices is something uh, maybe that we could say it's uh, not that, has not a, that long history as the practices. Uh, and this is something I would say uh, can, can make uh, public history not just uh, uh, something new, but especially something that can bring uh, innovate, innovation about the history of our discipline, the historical uh, practices. And uh, I think your talk was a wonderful uh, chance to, 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 to follow with you uh, the idea of uh, history, uh, doing the history of our practices, but at the same time putting in question, interrogating the basis of the building of these uh, historical approaches. Uh, so uh, this was my first point. I wanted to stress the idea that you you help us uh, bring an example of the histo uh, history of Britain, the, the English history uh, of these uh, historical practices how long they are, but at the same time, how important it is to do the research about the history of those practices and putting them on question. Uh, this is something I guess uh, it's very interesting for our group, as I started to say at the beginning. Uh, beside that, I would say for me, uh, especially, I was very glad to, to, to follow uh, your argument because you um, highlighted, in fact, how libraries are part of the history practices and is a field or, or a, uh, a part of the institution, institutionalization, I don't know if I can say the word, uh, of history. Uh, I mean, uh, we usually think that uh, the history is based on on the university uh, on 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 the um, um, uh, based on the research centers. Uh, and in fact, um, as you showed us very clearly, uh, the practice of doing research about history is uh, spread in any in many other fields of the society. And especially in the case of the libraries, mm -hmm. uh, I, 
I was amazed about the history of libraries you showed us in Britain, uh, in the in England, and uh, especially because we live in a country where, where we don't have the, the this wonderful library system that you have. And I noticed something very important. Uh, I would say uh, that the fact that this wonderful library system that you have in England uh, is the result of a policy, of a, a, a cultural policy uh, that supported the building and the institution of libraries in, in England. Uh, that's maybe um, uh, uh, why in Brazil we don't have this wonderful uh, a library system because we never had this wonderful policy to support the building and uh, the 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 maintaining of 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 this uh, uh, wonderful system and especially uh, to support the building of this uh, 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 this kind of photograph photograph collections uh, that you uh, explored so well. Uh, uh, doing your research and um, uh, study. Uh, and I would say that this makes a very important difference about the history of our country, the Brazilian uh, cultural system, and of course, uh, the system of Britain. I would, I, I'm, I'm saying this because uh, 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 I, I, I wonder if it's possible to, to to do some kind of research as you proposing in the same way uh, for the Brazilian case, uh, because we don't have this policy, we don't have this wonderful uh, 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 um, uh, library system. Uh, in this case, I would say it's, uh, um, for me, I was wondering how could we uh, um, um, be inspired by your study at the same time, uh, recognize uh, how different uh, the Brazilian history is. Uh, but at the same time, we can't forget that Brazil is also uh, a country where uh, photography was arise very early and uh, spread uh, very in a very popular way in our day, especially. Um, and we have a large history and tradition of photography in Brazil. Uh, and I was uh, um, uh, thinking, how could we, um, inspired by your uh, research, uh, think about the uh, particular case of the Brazilian uh, context? Um, I would say that this antiquarianism uh, uh, way of seeing uh, is all, also present in Brazil. Uh, I would say it's probably part of the history of photography in. In, in, in many other places. And, uh, um, and if we uh, uh, study a little bit about the, the uh, photography collections in Brazil, I, I would uh, say that uh, this antiquarianism, uh, uh, this pattern of gaze, uh, we could find also in Brazil in, that, in very different uh, 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 situations, but in this other, how we say, policy, uh, 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 the lack of this policy uh, uh, that you have in Britain, and um, um, but in any way, uh, I think the same uh, way of seeing this, the same antiquarianism uh, uh, pattern, we could find also in Brazil, um, although in different, uh, in different conditions of institutionalizing of uh, history and all these uh, photographic practices. What I really liked uh, uh, in your argument was when you uh, uh, linked the, the, the history of this practice with this photographic engagement, uh, the idea of this engagement. And I would say that uh, uh, this is maybe something we, we could uh, um, uh, enlarge somehow, improve uh, 
with this different uh, pattern of practices that we can find in Brazil and probably also uh, uh, in England. And uh, I would ask you uh, uh, to, to maybe to think about this uh, other different uh, uh, institutionalization of these practices of photo, these photographic practices, maybe in other fields that not on libraries. Um, especially because I know uh, um, uh, England is a country where we have uh, many historical societies uh, that has, I, I guess, the same practices uh, um, that could be inspired by these library practices. But I can imagine also that uh, um, there can be other, other, other spaces for these practices. In the case of Brazil, in our, uh, uh, among our colleagues, there are many that study photo clubs, uh, so photographic, photo, photographic societies, uh, that most of them, in the case of Brazil, has this artistic approach, this uh, uh, artistic way of seeing uh, things. Although uh, they also sometimes document uh, uh, the local history. Uh, I, I, I ask you if we could uh, 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 think about this, uh, um, this practice of uh, uh, documenting local history uh, or building this antiquarianism uh, uh, gaze in other uh, contexts of institutionalization of photography and history. Uh, uh, thinking that you, at the end, uh, uh, are answering Luciana Martins, you talk about the, how libraries and archives uh, are somehow linked in the history of these practices. Uh, and I was uh, uh, imagining uh, how could you, we uh, think about uh, other institutions that uh, make part of this uh, um, um, practice, uh, the whole or, or um, uh, practice, especially about this engagement, now nah, this, this photographic engagement that I would say is also a uh, heritage engagement uh, 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 part of it. Um, and I would say uh, from my personal experience that this heritage uh, engagement is very important for collecting these this, uh, photographs in our times. I would say uh, not recognizing just that the collection exists somewhere, but also find new collections that are not recognized or not institutionalized uh, and bringing them to the institutional heritage system. Um, well, uh, in fact, what I really wanted to to say is that I'm very glad to to be here, hearing you, following you, your your the development of your research, and I I really uh, thank you a lot uh, for for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo, for the extraordinary generous remarks. That's so kind. And I, I'm much heartened that, you know, coming from your specialization, that is your response to what I'm trying to do. Um, so so I, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, these questions of, you know, where, where does photography sit in a, in a public imagination of the past and indeed present and future, you know, that they are all very historically and politically and geographically located. There's no doubt about that. And I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And actually, when I said this is what I was going to talk about, I did say to Anna, are you sure this is going to work for a Brazilian audience where the structures of libraries are so different? And she said, oh, yeah, just go for it. So I did. <laughs> um, but I think before I go on, I should say, don't get over enthusiastic about the wonderful English or British library system. It is absolutely under threat at the moment. Um, decades of economic austerity, governments that don't care um, are really putting this vital resource um, at 
at risk and a lot of libraries have fired their professional staff they're run by volunteers and you know it, it's really libraries are in a dire state in this country um and um i mean i'm i try and support my local library just if i don't go there i don't need to use a local library but i go there just so they've got my feet coming through the door you know it's as bad as that so keep it open so don't be under any illusions you know it's a system that's crumbling fast and of course what worries one of course is as they close what happens to these marginal collections that are hidden in filing cabinets in library rooms that nobody really knows about i mean a perfect example of one of these hidden collections is at king's lynn which is a a little town on the norfolk coast it was extraordinarily rich in the middle ages it was the center of the hanseatic league or one of them and so traders would come down from the baltic and it still has a german consulate to this day because of those historical connections with northern germany what's now poland and you know it, it was and, and it's a tiny little place now and it has a survey it had a photographic survey which is very interesting because they didn't want to be part of the Norfolk survey which was based in Norwich as I said because what could anybody in Norwich which is all 40 miles down the road know about what happens in North Norfolk so they set up their own it was like UDI you know they, it was um they they did that they redefined what it was to be local and come from Norfolk and they did their own but what's really interesting about this they they get this little Carnegie library which is tiny it's smaller than my house and my house isn't big and they still got um the the Kingsland survey is still there it's in two filing cabinets in the reference library which is about the size of this room here that i'm sitting in it's a bit taller i'm in an attic and you know it's it's completely unknown and if this light if this library closes down i don't know what happens to this thing and so they are quite endangered at the moment through the state so this comes back to your questions about institutionalization and where heritage moves because i think you know it is it is a major problem at the moment and also the, the the problem of the physical archive as opposed to the digital archive because the the response to a lot of these threats to these marginal collections that as you say nobody really knows where they are and what they're doing is well we can digitize them and then you put the rest in the skip and in many ways um this is why I became interested in the materiality of photographs and people like Costanza Carafa in Florence has written a huge amount on the material archive. And it's a sort of Benjaminian moment of danger in which history flashes up in that moment of danger, as Walter Benjamin said. And I think, you know, this, this, this awareness of what is happening to these collections is actually a major political problem at the moment because you know, it's the politics of where the money goes you do you want a library or social care is basically what we're being told in britain now and um so i think these you know you're talking about how how heritage practices sort of move through different forms and things move and i think we're going to there's a danger that these things don't move and they're lost and I think it does become, you know, a major heritage problem, as you say. But to go to your wider point about how do we apply these sorts of methodologies outside a system such as I described, as I say, it's it's very much endangered at the moment. And that's why I said that, just in case you had a rosy idea of what was going on. It is not. Um, but I think I my feeling is that these kinds of ex I see these, I see my methodology as a mixture of what I might call ethnography, in that I'm in there in the journals listening to the voices. And I'm sure, you know, there are journals in Latin America, South America, about library practice. It's probably coming from the government and universities rather than local libraries. 
but you know, there will be a discourse about libraries and it's a matter of reading those both with the grain in the sort of Anne Stoller way of thinking about it, reading an archive in the, along the grain so you get a sense of the practices that are informing it and also against the grain so you can see what's going on that isn't fully articulated. So I think you've got these two actions against and, 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 and along the grain. And I, you know, a lot has been written about reading photographs against the grain. And so again, it's Walter Benjamin. Um, but I think, you know, Anne Stoller's idea of reading the archive along the grain so we can excavate ethnographically how these practices are working. And I think that's a methodology that can be used to in any form of institutionalization whether one's talking about local historical societies you know which are often quite elite groups that are gathering this material um, and i think the thing about the libraries in britain was that it, it it was this idea that it was for everyone um now you can say that's a kind of benign paternalism yes it was but it doesn't devalue what they were trying to achieve I don't think you just have to critically recognize the parameters of what you're looking at as one does with any historical investigation um, but I think you know as I said at the very end I think the research energy in history of photography or let's say photographically informed history because I I'm not 100% keen on the idea of history of photography as a category um, why is it just history photography and not just history or anthropology that happens to be through the prism of photographs? And, you know, personally, I get a little bit, a little bit tense when I'm described as a photographic historian because I'm not really. I'm, as, as um, Marcus said in his very generous introduction, I, I'm actually a visual historical anthropologist in that I, you know, I'm not a, you know, I do my anthropology and my history through the prism of the existence of photographs and what do they do to whatever our larger historical anthropological questions are. So I think that as a methodology is absolutely applicable anywhere, whatever the landscape of archiving is in any particular nation state, culture, um, you know, body of institutionalization i mean it's very interesting because i'm on I'm, I'm sure some of you are aware of it the photo impulse um project in the university of lisbon at the moment we have a conference in about a month which i meant to be going to but it doesn't look hopeful and um what's been really interesting there are the number of institutions in this particular case with colonial connections from Portugal largely into Africa um, but the number of institutions that they have discovered that have deposits of photographs as part of their history but that nobody has really realized are there and again I'm never very fond of the idea of hidden histories. They're not hidden, they're there all the time. You're just asking the wrong questions and looking in the wrong direction. If you just turn around, you'll see them. They're there. Um, and most of these histories have not just been, they're not been suppressed. They've just sort of sunk like archaeological layers through neglect of people looking in the wrong direction asking the wrong questions and this is why i think the kind of methodology that i've used to excavate through using in this case the journals which are really my major source and as i said i had a bit of a fight with a historian who said oh but your secondary sources i said they're not secondary sources how can you possibly call them secondary sources what century are you living in <laughs> these are absolutely primary sources um they have to be um because otherwise we can't do that history and if we just say oh they're secondary sources i you know where are your primary sources well they don't exist and i think you know one of the things doing this kind of history is important for and i you know from what you were saying i think you probably agree is that there is an enormous amount 
of huge historical importance um, through which we can ask much larger historical questions which aren't necessarily photographic or visual ones but if you go in through the prism of the visual and the photographic it's going to refigure your question and how you think about it completely but these are beneath the archival radar there are th things that are seen as so peripheral and unimportant that they are not institutionalized and i think you know, the idea of things falling out of institutionalization through neglect or digitization or whatever, I find very, very worrying. An example that was in what I was talking about are these, these little reward cards for school children. These are really interesting um, and they exist on eBay and that's about it. Um, I know one archive who's got a synthetic collection of them because they just realized they happened and they bought some. But it's not a, an archival deposit of an institutional structure in any way. You know, it's, a, it's not, a, if you like, um, a natural, organic archive. It's a synthetic one. But these little cards are so interesting because what you're getting is a circulation of view photography. Um, which you know, the historical geographers have written about an awful lot about how these photographs construct place in a certain imagination. And they are literally put into the hands haptically of working class children. And the idea was that if you got one a month for the whole of the school year, you got a bronze medal. It was the bronze medal they wanted. But the, this idea of these historical images of castles of sites of battles and interestingly going back to what luciana was asking of colonial sites as well are being put literally into the hands of working class children for them to take home and these are homes that were not materially rich and i think these going and going back to your point about you know what's out there that we don't really appreciate that it's out there we don't see it as a collection it's not institutionalized and i think this is a perfect example of the circulation of images that made possibly a profound um, influence on some child's imagination of nation and locale um but it's completely undocumented i've gone off point a little bit does that help of course thank you we could talk much more about it we could talk uh, ever about this because i think <laughs> one of the I things about a wonderful point of view about the how doing research about it that's uh, i think for our group is the most important yeah exactly and i, th I think it's you're taking these methods yeah. um to any body of material and thinking if you like horizontally and vertically about the kind of questions you're asking about things and also being a very, very aware of what lies around it that is not archived, that is, as I say, like the school reward cards below the archival radar. Because you know, I think I think that's that's where the interesting work that's going to position the work of the visual within a, a broader historical remit is going to emerge. Looking at sort of key documentary photography like all the textbooks tell you you know if you if, if you want to use photographs as historical sources and they use the migrant mother the raising of the flag on Irojima, Irojima, sorry um and the child in the warsaw ghetto walking towards the camera with his hands up and they always use those photographs and how to use photographs as historical sources they're completely not the kind of photographs that any historian is actually who's serious about this is actually going to encounter they're going to encounter the grubby little photographs in family albums and the kinds of collections that i've been talking about all the collections that are in you know some obscure colonial um library in an ex-colonial capital uh it these are what these are the ones that actually are historically important in my mind and so we've got to we've got to have the courage to 
bring them into the center of historical analysis and use the kind of methodologies we've all been talking about. That's my view. I can be fired now. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, the, the last debate is Marcos de Brun Lopes. He is a historian and cultural affairs technician at Museu Casa de Benjamin Constant in, and the of, of Maribaldi, a reporter, reporter, photo reporter do Brazil. Marcos. Thank you very much. I hope you are hearing me well. If mm -hmm. not, just make me a sign. It's uh, good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Anna, for the invitation, and thank you so much, Professor Edwards, for the, the, the lecture. It was very insightful. Uh, I have uh, some notes I have taken down here, and I love the idea of this uh, civil pride and identity that people can find in local uh, archives libraries and histories. Uh, I, I also liked the idea of this educational task that uh, photography would undertake in these uh, processes, in these uh, contexts. And I also liked this sentence you said, past understanding to the benefit of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that, that, that section of your speech because it made me think of the role of photography in the very uh, ancient and old idea of history as master of life. Uh, this idea never dies, I guess, and it's, it's uh, renewed and re-signified. And maybe photography just was laying another layer to it because mm -hmm. to, to think of uh, libraries and these collections as uh, an endeavor of past understanding, but to, to the benefit of the future made me think of it. Uh, but the first job I had in, in, in my life as a historian was in a local library mm -hmm. slash archive slash house of culture, as we call it in Brazil. And I remember very fondly that uh, many students, local students would, would come to us with all sort, sorts of questions. And uh, back then, my boss was this very sweet and uh, old lady. And she was that kind of woman that would uh, tell all the local histories by heart, whatever your question was. And I never dared to say she was, you know, producing uh, secondary sources. <laughs> <laughs> she would be very mad because she was the source of local histories. And uh, many times she would just open a drawer with a lot of photographs as visual aids to what she, she was telling us. And this, uh, of course, these testimonies and these uh, oral uh, documents are extremely important. And I don't know why we are stuck in this uh, old a hierarchy of sources like primary and secondary because right. by, the, by the end of the day they are all documentations and it all depends on on the questions you 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 pose to this to these uh, documents or photographs or whatever they are mm -hmm. so um well but my comments uh they are not uh, i don't have many many comments but i was thinking uh, I was about to ask if the librarian's interest on photography was much more a matter of historical information than a matter of aesthetics. But then uh, you said that many librarians who were also antiquarians were the ones who would promote local uh, visual collections the most. So uh, it makes me think that it's more complicated than this simple opposition of historical facts and information versus uh, aesthetics, because uh, antiquarian history would rely very much on objects and uh, visual arts and, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, this was my first, uh, my, my first note here. Uh, 
uh but also that this whole idea of political representation I, I think it can be expanded by the relation between photographs and uh civil pride and identity and i think there are quite a few researchers thinking in that direction nowadays yeah. uh, if we think of public sphere as a space of appearance uh the citizen will physically appear on this space as much as he or she can be can be represented uh, in it by the history told in public collections, I guess, especially if his his body and his actions are caught by the camera uh, to his benefit or not. Uh, I remember that we received in this place I was talking about a very large collection of a formal mayor of this small town here in Brazil. Uh, it was donated by his uh, grand his granddaughter. And we were organizing this, this collection. It was a very big mess. And I found a picture of a, of a pol political rally of, his, of her uh, grandfather. And I was looking at that, that, that picture and this, my boss, this old and sweet lady was helping me. And she pointed to someone in the crowd in this picture. Uh, and she asked me, do you know who that is? And, I said, no, this is a picture from the 1950s. I was born in 1985. <laughs> I have no idea who that is. So this is your, your girlfriend's grandmother. So I found my girlfriend's, who is now my wife, uh, grandmother in that political rally. She was about 11 years old. Uh, and I, I made a copy of that photograph and gave her as a, pres as a Christmas gift. And she was, what was I doing I, like alone at night in this political rally at age 11. So her body and her actions were caught by the camera that day. And we ended up uh, meeting that picture decades <laughs> later. So he, so she started to tell us this whole local story about this mayor and who was his political uh, uh, opponents and what she was uh, listening in that rally that day. And it was a, a lovely night of stories, of local stories, uh, uh, prompted by this picture. So this is a, 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 a tiny example of what I'm I'm trying to say of this this space of appearance where we can we can actually appear there, but we can actually appear by being represented by these collections and and these institutions. Uh, so expanding this idea of civil representative. Mm -hmm. that is uh, basically the parliament, but uh, to mean public institutions and pictures that they produce and preserve uh, can be also uh, a civil rep uh, representational device, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are my, 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 my comments, but I do have uh, a couple of questions, uh, two of which you have answered. Uh, <laughs> I was about to ask, uh, how would you still describe your work as uh, an anthropological research as much as uh, historical? Uh, but you have uh, answered that. Of course, you can you can tackle that that uh, issue again if you want. And what the reception among uh, historians and, and anthropologists uh, has been, or <laughs> what you expected uh, <laughs> it to be. Uh, but I do have a, a last question about this open access, uh, now digital or virtual libraries and archives and the mm -hmm. policies of picture manipulation. Because many times when we digitize uh, pictures, we don't allow the public to, to actually uh, have the pictures in their hands anymore. Uh, and Marcos Oliveira is here. And he has he has uh, been experiencing this in, in archives in Portugal. Uh, sometimes we you, you are not allowed to, you know to to look at the back of the picture uh, as much as you can look uh, uh, to the front of it in, in a screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, of course there is a problem of conservation and preservation and and so on. But in in the UK, uh, how are the uh, could you describe these policies of manipulation in the age of digital uh, photographs? So these are my, my, my comments. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to hear you. 
Thank you very, very much, Marcus, um, for your comments. I mean, the first thing that struck me is, you know, you the way you were talking is the the absolutely fundamental connection between visuality and orality, particularly with photographs, in that the first thing people do with photographs put into their hands is to start talking. And why are these seen as marginal forms in history? I have no idea. Um, because it's actually central to what most people want photographs to be for them. Um, and one of the things I've looked in larger um, um, project, which brings us to your last point, is that very materiality of, of, of the mounted photograph put into the hands, like the school reward cards, of anybody who wanted to look at them. And a lot of these library photographs are mounted and they actually talk about mounting them so that people can handle them without harming the image. So this very, very strong sense of them being put into people's hands and presumably they start talking. Most people, most that's the usual reaction to photographs. Um, your point about um, the public space is really important. This is actually a part of the much larger project um, that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how the visibility of photographs um, works in the public sphere as a form of public history and as a, po uh, uh, a point of sort of civic engagement and uh, civic identity. Um, I think that I showed a slide of a sort of wall with some photographs in Stamford, which is a market town in Lincolnshire um, and I'm very interested in the these sort of photographic walls that now you find everywhere in the digital world um, because all you need is a very large scan and off you go you can fill a wall with a photograph and it's 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 really interesting how these tech new technologies are being used um, to fill the public space with the 19th century and the early 20th century and I'm very interested in the time slippages that one finds in um, in the way photographs appear in the public sphere and and the way the individual is encouraged to respond to them as, as an embodied experience I think you know there's another huge paper on that anyway to your question about um, the digital um, where does one start? I mean, I think, as I started to say in response to somebody else's, I think it was Paolo, Paolo's question, is that um, that sense of um, how we access images and what libraries think can be done with them. And regrettably, and I, I'll come back to why I say regrettably, the instant response to a photograph collection these days is, oh, we can digitize it. I think there are many reasons for this, um, and it's not all of them particularly laudable, in that um, photograph collections are seen as completely reducible to their content. A lot of institutions don't do the backs of them. You were saying, you know, you can't see the back of them exactly because of course it doubles the cost of digitization if you've got to do two scans for every image. Um, there is, and I think one of, the, one of the problems with the ubiquity of the digital image now is that it has pushed historical collections back into being just gobbets of information. There's very, very little really constructive, and there's some, really constructive digital projects with photographs. And those are usually quite sort of what I would call boutique projects. They're really quite small, they're manageable. But you know, if you're the Library of Congress with how many million photographs and you're told that you have to have a digital program, it's very, very difficult to know how to prioritize. So I think one of the problems is the priorities that are given in digitization which collections are done and which are not and this going back to the earlier discussion has major implications historiographically because what is made visible digitally now tends to be the material that is written about 
and anything that is not digitized disappears from historical sight completely. And I think this has major historiographical implications because what is digitized isn't necessarily the most interesting or the most important in historiographical terms. It tends to be the most valuable or the most popular. And so you get collections that are digitized um, that are really not that important or perhaps not typical of not typical of an institution. And I can report a conversation I had with a major institution that with a huge photograph collection that better remain nameless. But I said to the head of photographs, I said, you know, that's a very interesting collection to have digitized, but I don't quite understand it, you know, how that decision was made, um, given everything else you've got. And I wouldn't have thought it was either the most representative or the most um, important in terms of your institutional profile. And um, the answer was, you're not going to believe this, oh, well, they're all the same size, so we could do them very quickly and we could we could get to our targets. But the the implications of that and the legacy of that is that this collection, it has its points. Um, this collection is going to rise like historiographical cream to the top and going to be used. I already see the you know the ripples on the pond from this action. In, in what's published and what isn't. And it's going to rise to the historiographical top like cream, regardless of whether it's actually historically significant or not. And as institutions, as you were saying, make it increasingly difficult for the serious historian to see original material. And the number of times I've been told, oh, you can see it online. And you say, well, in the catalogue, it says it's got X number of photographs from wherever. And I can't see them online. Oh, we didn't do those ones. They're not interesting. Well, who's making that decision of what's interesting or not? And this, you know, we're getting these endless bits of digital filtering, digital editing. Before we even get to questions of manipulation, don't start me on colorization because we'll be here all night. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll be here all night and you'll be here all afternoon. <laughs> and you know, I think it's, I actually think it's very, very serious. And I think that there hasn't been enough written about the historiographical implications of what's happening and what's being put into circulation, but what is not being put into circulation. Well, I wouldn't mind so much if you could still go to the archive and not be told, oh, it's all online. I'm sorry we don't let out originals any longer, as you rightly say, for conservation reasons. No, you just don't want to show me, do you? But don't repeat me on that. Could you edit that bit out of the tape? <laughs> but, you know, thank you, Anna. But, you know, I think I think we've got very real challenges. And but I think, you know, the problem is from institutions, they are I, I don't, certainly in Europe and the States. I don't know what it's like in Brazil and um, South Africa and other places like that. But there is constant political pressure attached to government funding in its broadest sense around impact and access. And if you can show you've digitized things, you can argue that that is access. I have to ask access to what? Because I think it's often ignorance. It doesn't necessarily go with research cataloging or any improvement in cataloging at all. Um, and it certainly doesn't go hand in hand with access necessarily. But there's this sort of dream, this shimmerer, that this is somehow improving our access to things. It is at one level, if you just want to see a picture of what a cow looked like in rural Yorkshire in the late 19th century, sure, you can find one online, but it doesn't really help us 
as historians, does it? And I think there's a wonderful essay, I don't know if you know, it was in the um, American Historical Review uh, a few years ago by Lisa Putman. And it, she talks about the, the perils of the digital archive and what it's doing to historiography. And she has this wonderful phrase, which is, uh, have any of you read it? She talks about side glancing, that side glancing where, where you, you're moving across a body of material without really understanding what that material is, because you just go to the next image and the next image. Now, yes, you could argue that as historical research, that's actually quite can be quite creative because it's it's making juxtapositions for you that you wouldn't necessarily have found in the physical archive. But I, I think you've got to be very sure for as a historian to know what you're doing um, with that kind of thing because I think it can collapse into the most trivial readings of photographs. And this is my fear. And the, this digital policy that you were talking about is forcing us down this direction. And we don't actually have the analytical tools to deal with it yet, unless you're doing very, very contained, what I call, as I said, boutique digital um, projects with a very clear, Aim. I mean, there are some wonderful, wonderful ones like the Tibet album at Pitt Rivers was one I was involved with. And I think Isabella Stewart Gardner's um, travel albums from the, the Gardner Museum in Boston is another example from art history of a really intelligent piece of digi uh, digitization where you really can get a sense of the object and how it sits with other objects and other images and how it sits materially and you can get this full sense of the object. I mean, and there are these, there are some very good projects out there, but the run of the mill digitization done by public libraries, public museums, I think is sad. Shall I put it like that? Sorry, I've ranted for long enough. You've got homes to go to. <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, thank you it's the, the really important. No, it's great. I, I, you have I, we have a uh, uh, John that wants to make make you a, a question. <laughs> you have time to uh, another round of of conversation. Just one round, and John uh, can can make his question, and uh, uh, two, two more. Uh, uh, can can do the question too. I I I okay, Elizabeth. To yeah, that's Ellen. fine. Okay, I'll have to go so and buy some food at some point, but yeah. it's not a problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, if you were right. here, we could feed you. <laughs> okay. uh, digitally. Um, uh, hi, Elizabeth. Um, okay. Good to see you. Wonderful talk. Very illuminating. Uh, as always, I was delighted to see you mention your idea of strong histories and mm -hmm. photography. I cite you all the time about that. Oh, do that uh, little article, a little afterward. I think we're in the same volume. You're in that same volume, aren't oh, you? Yes, yes, yeah. right, I right, yeah. So. But I don't think I cite you there. I cite you all the time in oh, Mexico right. because, mm -hmm. because here we have a different situation. We don't really have libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so instead what we have are phototecas that have yeah. been constructed from about the 70s on, mm. uh, enormous with millions of, of yeah. images. Uh, and, 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 and basically, I think the next move will be toward the construction of regional phototecas. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, in arguing for that, I often cite your argument of strong histories and, I, and uh, you know, whether the, the money will be there to do it or not, whether or not there are, you know, um, um, journals about libraries and that stuff in Mexico, I really don't know. But as mm -hmm. I say, there's essentially no libraries. So, mm -hmm. so photographic preservation collection has been a role of phototecas. There's more than 500, I think, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I thought very interesting the idea that uh, photograph, the way in which photographs show uh, progress, it made me think of looser the way that photographs not only conserve the past but project the future 
I just found your article online about absorption, so I will uh, I recommend that to everybody. There it is on a PDF. Um, I was wondering to what extent you had talked about the the hesitancy of librarians to include photographs, and I wondered to what extent that might be due to problems of conservation and of cataloging. No, because cataloging is always an enormous, I mean, conservation is an enormous problem, but cataloging is too. You know, mm -hmm. if photographs aren't cataloged, they're simply, they disappear. Mm -hmm. um, I'll look forward to reading this book about the absent-minded imperialist. Uh, as um, somebody who comes from the U.S., I wouldn't say there's been no impact of imperialism uh in u.s i'm in u.s the u.s now watching the school shootings uh which i think are probably immediately related to uh, u.s imperialism i wonder to what extent it's not absent-mindedness but simply denial um i sort of differ with you about the idea when you say you're not a historian of photography i say no i, I don't like that term either but I do call myself a photo historian. Uh, I think we have to carve out a place for us among historians. Historians have rejected us as they have rejected modern media in general. And, and so, you know, my fight for 50 years has been, they have to accept us. Uh, <laughs> and finally, with digitalization, I'll, I'll, I will certainly look for the Putman, Putman article in the AHR. Uh, also, Martha Sandweiss has yeah. some very, very good reflections on, you know, problems of, of researching digital photography. But again, I compliment you on a really wonderful, uh, uh, illuminating uh, talk. Thank you so much. Great to see you again. Thank you, John. If I can just say about, you know, the photo techers, I mean, I think, um, I think, I think you could certainly use the same questions that I've been applying to late 19th century British libraries into the construction of these phototechers. I think you could use exactly that methodology and exactly that questioning. It's just a few years later. I mean, they're being gathered on a regional basis, um, questions about you know, what kind of past is valued and what kind of past is not valued. They're all, you know, Things that were informing my librarians are surely informing those phototechers as well. And so I think you know, as a methodology and you say, well, we have no libraries to look at. Yeah, but as I was saying earlier, I think, you know, you, you can use this methodology in a way of thinking about the institutionalization of photographs and you know, the thinking behind that in any form of accumulation. Um, and there are plenty of people who have. I mean, I'm thinking of, I mean, I'm thinking of huge collections and people like Estelle Blaschka, who you, I'm sure we know, who works on, um, did a wonderful book on the Bettman Archive, which was a picture library. And there's been a lot of very interesting work on these huge collections. And um, there's a very interesting French journal called Transbordeur, which looks at the social and cultural practices of photography. And there've been a lot of articles in there on, if you like, not irregular photograph collections that accumulate in strange learned societies and libraries and, um, you know, enthusiast museums and things like that. And the, there's some very good work coming out of particularly, I think, France and Germany at the moment on, on those. So, you know, check out Transbordeur because I think they, they do some very interesting things. Um, well, are we photo historians or not? I don't know. <laughs> Um, yes, I have been fighting, uh, present company accepted, of course, um, I have been um, fighting the historians for decades now to be taken seriously. Have you ever noticed, and this goes back to earlier conversations we've been having today, is how oral sources, film and photography are always put in the last chapters of books the undergraduates read on historical methodology under the label alternative sources. I'm sorry, this is the 21st century. What's alternative about them? Yeah, uh, it, I, it drives me nuts, I have to say. They're not alternative sources. They're absolutely key sources. And we haven't talked about film at all today, but, you know, films up there 
as another problem. And, and in fact, my libraries actually, towards the end of the period, talk about do we collect moving pictures? And they don't actually because they're worried about A, the conservation of them, and B, you can't just hand them to somebody to look at like a book that you actually need some sort of technological translation, a projector, to be able to use them so they don't collect film, which is interesting. Rather than the way that people don't collect born digital now because they don't quite know what to do with it. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 you're certainly right. I, uh, the the Casa Sola collection obviously was related to the perfect dictatorship. Uh, here in Mexico, the million um, negative collection uh, in the Fototeca Nacional. But on the other hand, you have the, you know, and, and then it's just an acquisition for an acquisition you, with the National Archive acquiring the, the five million negative Mayo archive. Uh, but yeah, certainly you're right. There's, you know, there's a reason behind the acquisition of every every single archive, and one would have to go, one would have to apply that methodology to find. Yeah, and what I want to think about it. I mean, not obviously about in, <clears throat> sorry, about series of images. I mean, you would go mad if one tried to do it at a single image level. But I think you know that's another methodology that we need to think about very seriously. You know, trouble with working on photographs is that we've inherited. I mean, it's less so than it used to be. But we've her inherited methodologies from art history, which you know you look mm -hmm. at an image and you think about it. And actually, for a vast majority of photographs, that's just not a tenable methodology yeah. you're looking at huge series um and you're looking for patterns and so forth there's a great book has anybody <clears throat> come across it called photography at scale well no photography off the scale um it came out from university of edinburgh press at the beginning of this year or last year because of the pandemic and lockdowns i've lost all track of years <laughs> books just came and i don't know when they came <clears throat> but it, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really interesting. It's looking at you know, how we deal with the billions of photographs. And there's a there's a great essay in there by a former student of mine. Um, it's still a great essay, even she wasn't a former student of mine. Um, um, at, uh, Bella Pollen on what's happening to these slide libraries in art history departments, which are completely superfluous to. Um, to um, purpose now absolutely superfluous and so a lot of them have been thrown out yet it's the archaeology of the discipline and you know going back to uh, what marcus was saying that you know looking at something on a work of art on a computer screen is not the same as looking at it say projected it's the materiality of of the mode of viewing and um, of course computers have their own materialities as many people have pointed out um and so that's a really great book i think you might enjoy it i think mm -hmm. it's photography off the scale thank you and it's got some great essays or it, it's slightly on the art historical side but it's got some really great essays in most enjoyable <laughs> thank you elizabeth uh, thank you for your yeah. your time yeah. Uh, I, I, I have, uh, actually, I, I, I have a, a lot of questions. I won't last too much. Uh, I, I want just to, 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 to go back to, uh, to this uh, preoccupation. I, I, I'm reading your last book, Photography and Practice of History, in the Kindle version, <laughs> because it, right. it's impossible to buy books here in Brazil now, because we are under very, very, very bad inflation and uh, I, I i was reading your forwards and your introduction it reminded me two events of my own trajectory that but i won't tell you because it would last too much but uh, i was thinking so uh, why such a resistance why does historian and historical practice are so uncomfortable in dealing with photography i i have come through very very uncomfortable situations in presenting my work when i was phd students and then uh, john was there in the international network of 
Theory and History Conference in Puebla last uh, April. Uh, John, I, myself, and Patricia Hayes and uh, her group of research was the only one who were working with photographs. And it was a conference about media and mediation. And it's, it's it, the resistance. Uh, yes, it's, it's unbelievable. I started to work uh, with photographers in the, in the late 80s. And until now, Paulo and I, which belongs with the Laboratory of Oral History and Image, because we joined both of this, <laughs> this last chapters of the, the handbooks, because we are trying to connect that our laboratory is 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 uh, performing in four year forty years now. So since 1980, 1982, we've been working uh, with photographs for history and trying to develop the history of memory. And we are still now uh, asking for place in our university. We are fighting for a room there. So you can imagine how, uh, the, why such a resistance? I, will, as, uh, I have a, a two uh, uh, founding, uh, founding mother and a founding father of the field here, John and you. I would like to listen from you. It, it's, a, it's a historical opportunity. Why such a resistance? We have methodology. We, we we are very much interdisciplinary, talk uh, different languages. But why such a resistance? Reading your introduction, I was really affected. I was really affected. Actually, I think the whole book is a, a present for our students. I hope we can translate it into, into Portuguese or even in Spanish. So oh, a, 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 large, a large uh, audience would, I, 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 will, I will try to, John and I have a very good connection with Central Photography of Montevideo. They have a very good group there. Maybe they can embrace the project in translating this book because it's a very mm. important reference for not only for the methodology because it uh, goes beyond methodology i think your book is a very important reflection such as john is about your trajectory and also the way the field is being built from this last 40 years so i think it's very important and that's why i put this question why such a resistance we've we have this this uh, antiquarian tradition of what correcting so on. We have the, 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 the heuristics to work with this, but why? Why we're still such a going on the rogue? <laughs> why? I don't know. I would like to just to, to, to have a closing uh, catharsis. <laughs> well, from my perspective, um, I'm interested to see what John has to say. Um, I think it's, and this is what the book's about really, and why um, a good friend of mine is Professor of Contemporary European History here at Oxford, has warned me to take shelter when the reviews come out from historians, um, <laughs> is that I think the very presence of photography, and this sort of bleeds over into questions of memory and orality as well, as we've discussed, I think it actually challenges the very premise of the practice of history. It really, and this is what the book's about, it challenges our notion of what an event and an unfolding of time might be, it challenges the scales in which we might work, it certainly I think as I say in the book challenges our easy identification of context, I think it goes to the very, I think the very existence of photographs goes to the very, very heart of what it is to do history in the modern age. And I take that from about 1870, where we had the mass, uh, the mass presence of photographs. And as for now, uh, and, and that's what I think the resistance is. Um, and I also think, whereas historians and I was a medievalist to begin with. You wouldn't believe that now, but I, I, I started historical life before I went into anthropology. 
And I kind of went into anthropology because it gave me a way out of some of these conundra. Um, is that um, we're so textually based as historians and our training is so textually based that it's very difficult to see beyond that and accept that there are other ways of doing history. Now, I do have to say, I think it is changing. I do think it is. When I see the younger generation coming up who are completely at home visually, orally, um, digitally, I think it is changing. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at um, younger scholars like Erica Hanna, who's a historian of Ireland and did a brilliant paper in Journal of British History on the different interpretations of photographs in the official inquiries into the troubles in Northern Ireland. And she's a serious historian and she's writing her image her history through the prism of the image and i think she's she's just one example i mean you talk about patricia hayes in fact i'm seeing her tomorrow um we're going on holiday together <laughs> <laughs> for two days and um you know, she's another one and you know the work she's done in in western cape with a new generation of brilliant young historians coming up and this is why I think her book Ambivalent is so good, because it's written by all sorts of historians, largely out of African institutions, who are just thinking differently about history and about where the image fits with it. And I think, you know, I actually think the dynamics of what kinds of histories we can do with photographs is coming from the global south where these traditions of history are not necessarily as entrenched as I, I started life as a medievalist and I made the transition to photography. Um, I don't want to bore people with the foundation myth, but except it's not a myth. I was that generation of grad students in the early 1970s, which rather puts a date on me, um, who sat at the feet of Raphael Samuel. I remember going to seminar with Raphael Samuel and he was talking about women's history, working class history, immigrant, emigrant, black histories. And he was talking about alternative sources. How do we excavate this, this, the, these histories that are suppressed beneath the archival radar, but beneath the usual sources that we usually use as historians. And yeah, you know, I have to say it was like falling in love. You could thought, oh my God, I didn't know that doing history could be like this. <laughs> and it's because I can put it down to Raphael Samuel, who was very embarrassed in later life when I told him this, um, sitting at his feet and thinking, well, how do we do this? And it's that that I abandoned the Middle Ages with all those legal reforms and texts which I was taught to read and I discovered photography because it was a way into this new exciting way of doing history. In 1971 to a girl brought up on the legal reforms of Henry II and the papal court this was just the most incredible thing that had ever happened. <laughs> so that's I don't understand why if I can make that conversion, so can everybody else. And I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you are not, you were, you're still young to rock and roll, Elizabeth. <laughs> I, 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 maybe some of this, Anna, this conversation is not for public dissemination. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, what we call in this country Chatham yeah. House rules, yeah. where politicians and so forth get together <laughs> to discuss yeah. burning orders of the day. Yeah. And you you can quote the ideas, but you can never say where they came yeah. from. <laughs> Just great. I'm, I'm, I'm gl glad that you mentioned Raphael Samuel, because I think his article, The, the Eye of History, is still oh. pertinent. You know, I mean, he must have been a brilliant, brilliant fellow. Uh, 
And, and I love the way that he talks about how secondary school teachers are more accepting of using images than, than yes. professors, yeah. uh, you know, in the Oxbridge uh, community. I think the problem is, to begin with, history, we're, we're very careful as a discipline yeah. to begin with. Uh, and I think, in my experience, as I've gone around and I've, I've lectured in a million places, uh, what I hear historians say to me is, I don't know how to read them. I don't understand it. Teach us, teach us how to read them. And that's why I wrote that book, uh, History and Modern Media. That's why I wrote that chapter about how to do history with photographs, because I found myself giving these lectures and, and, and having professors that were not rejecting it, not resisting it, just didn't know how to do it. And it, it, it reminded me of when I wanted to do a, my, a film for my dissertation back in the uh, back around in the mid 70s and when i proposed it uh, one of the members of my committee said well how would i possibly judge a film for a dissertation how could i judge the 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 research required to make a film i've ne never made a film and i said fine i finally understood it i said hey i get it you know the coin drop i said yeah uh, but I think the problem is, is it, you know, that, that, that's the problem. But I think that, um, it, it, we also have to realize that this begins with technical images. I mean, people that study that certainly, uh, earlier periods, archeologists and probably even medievalists, you know, studied images. It's the technical images they can't deal with the mm -hmm. photographs. And it really does require. I think that it takes a good deal more training and thought. And that's what's been exciting about working in photography because we've been inventing the methodologies as opposed to film study. Film study, you know, when I, that's what I did first. The problem with film study is that, um, you know, very quickly they formed that discipline. The, the you know, the first professors came out of uh, literary studies, complete. You know, and then they had film study stuff. And um, uh, my sense is that photographic study is a much wider study. And we are making every single uh, genre of photography is going to require a different methodology. You know, whether that's photojournalism, whether that's revolutionary photography, or whether it's um, you know, uh, 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 advertising, you know, whatever, you know, but as, as you pointed out, Elizabeth, also we're entering a field that it, it's not like it's a new field because we're entering a field that's been filled up by coffee table books, uh, you know, where photographs have been used very lightly. And, and so, you know, what we're doing is insisting, no, 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 uh, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to invent, and, and it's been filled up by art historians. Yeah. You know, and that is a real problem. You I know, think it's that, a major problem. I agree. Yeah. You know, five, what is art? I mean, I, I thought in the beginning that history of photography was a sub-genre of history of art. And now I think that History of art photography is a subgenre of history of photography or photo history, really, yeah. in the sense that really vernacular ph photographs are like 95% of photographs. Art photographs are like 5% of all photographs. And, well, and not, <clears throat> Can I come in here? It's very interesting that you say that because for years I have pulled up my students for talking about vernacular photography. Ah. No, I say no. It's majority practice. It's photography, and art ah. photography is has to be qualified, which I call self-conscious aesthetic practice. Ah. It's a minority form. Yes. <laughs> if they're going to be rude about everyday photography by calling it vernacular, I shall be equally dismissive about art photography by calling it self-conscious. <laughs> Oh, I sort of like the idea of vernacular because I have so much problems with the concept of documentary. I hate to use documentary because yeah, then, I don't use that either. You know, yeah, it sort of gets divided between art and documentary. 
Mm. You know, as if they somehow were 50-50. But most Uh, photographs are neither. Most photographs are just photographs. Well, are all photographs or documentaries? That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. they're just... They're basically social images of one sort or another. Yeah. Can I, can I just say something else? Because you made me think yeah. about it when you were talking about, you know, how this idea of, you know, the, this this obsession that we have to read photographs. Hmm. And of course, you know, as we all know, they're subject to many, many readings. They're hmm. not quite infinitely recodable, but almost. And do you think that this is one of the problems that historians have with it? That, you know, historians are trained, as was I, and still am, to look for evidence. You want evidence through which you can build a credible account of something, Uh whatever it is you're studying. And photographs are actually very resistant to being evidential at one level. Um, because it depends on that reading you bring to them. And I wonder if one of the problems that you've described is, goes back to what I was saying about, you know, uh, uh, going to the very basic principles of what it is to practice history, is that in the, they're frustrated by the search for the evidential, but they're not prepared to stand back and think of photographs as a kind of thought space. Mm-hmm. That they're not necessarily evidential in the way that historians, and I'm, I must say, present company accepted. I must say um, that you know, historians are classically taught to think about evidence, and in many ways, photographs, because of their very fluid meaning, the difficulty of pinning down um, exactly what they mean, as opposed to what they're of which might be something a little bit different um is is that part of that problem that they they cannot be read okay texts are malleable as well we all know that they're open to different interpretations but i think they have a greater text on the whole this is a massive generalization have slightly well not more than slightly they have a constraint around them of certain forms you know inquisition reports are inquisition reports now we all know from some of the 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 wonderful work that's been done in italian microhistory and so forth that you know those are you know very fluid documents but they're not they're sure not as fluid as a photograph And I wonder if it's that sense of malleability, which is very disturbing in evidential terms, but at the same time, a broad reluctance to look at something that looks like evidence, but actually could be treated more as a thought space. And I think this is particularly so when you start multiplying up the huge numbers of photographs we're back to this question of photo- photographs and scale um the abundance of photographs that actually they become almost illegible as individuals because there are so many that are possibly speaking in different dialects around the same things it's almost impossible to control as a form of classical evidence but if you can accept that they en masse create a kind of think space now this has been called a kind of visual regime you could but i'm not necessarily sure that's the right language for what i'm trying to get at because visual regime has a sort of slightly determining factor to it and that this is the visual regime that comes out of a, a set of thought thought set or something a set of cultural attitudes or something like that I think a think space has to be as a space that historians make for themselves in which they a critical space through which they think through their questions and their sources and how they're working with one another. And I think I think photographs can create that thought space. What do you think, John? Yes. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a very interesting notion. Exactly. Exact I think that it's um it, they allow for exploration. They're clues. 
mm. you know, and, and we can follow up those clues and explore uh, and open up issues. You know, I think that maybe you're right, that that's what makes them uncomfortable is that mm. there, there is that, that infinite number of variables. But of course, that's also very much, that's very contemporary. When we think about what the problems I have as an old person dealing with computers and uh, uh, all this stuff, is that it, it, there's just too many variables. There's just too many possibilities of the, you know what went wrong, you know. And whereas young people have no problem with that, you know, it's sort of like oh it's this or it's that or da da da, you know. And and I think that uh, uh, in that sense it strikes me that 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 photographs again. Uh, I think appeal, you know, very much more to to the younger generation. Yeah, let's I say. think you're absolutely younger, right you know. because they they're used to negotiating those sorts of scales and fluidities, um, yeah. which you know, girls brought up on medieval documents are not right. necessarily unless they force themselves to be. Right. And, right. and and photographs are being more accepted. I forget where I was oh, giving the lecture, um, um, I think on the Red Latino Americano, and a woman uh, who, who was at, I forget what university she was doing her doctorate at, and she said, I've had no problem getting yeah. photographs accepted as evidence. And I said, oh, my heavens, who's the photo historian there? And she said, there's no photo historian here, yeah. but they've accepted the fact that photographs are a form of historical evidence. Mm. And I mean, good heavens, we live in a hypervisual world. There's just no way that they can keep, you know, that they can keep uh, denying it. And the, the other thing that I think that photographs can do is they can allow us to tell, they can allow us to construct vignettes. Uh, you know, uh, people's attention span is so short now. Mm. And I remember one of the first articles I wrote with photographs was about nixtamal. Nixtamal is the cornmeal out of which Mexicans make their tortillas, which is the base of life in Mexico. You know, everything is eaten with tortillas. Well, I found five photographs of nixtamal workers in February of 1919. And then I found stories, uh, letters, from an inspector he'd taken these photographs and then his letters about the lives of these women well not there was no information about these women before or after or next to my workers in general there was simply no historical information whatsoever so i constructed a vignette about these women's lives you know mm -hmm. uh, and it was absolutely fascinating i remember i gave the lecture in a class at uc santa cruz and the students uh, said well what happened to those women and i said Nobody knows, you know, those women entered into history because photographs were made of them. And there's no mention of Nixtama workers 10 years after or 10 years before, you know, and, and, and so I think, and yet the photographs made them so present, yeah. you know, so present in a way that, 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 you know, had I simply found the documents, I could have written something about, you know, these documents, you know, show. But to have the photographs just made them so present that the, you know, the students were moved, were moved to ask that, well, what happened to them? Well, who knows? But, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that's a wonderful example of how, you know, one can use presence as a way into other mm -hmm. historical questions. And, and the way photo, and I think this is why I argue in the book that, you know, photographs actually change the scale of the kind of historical questions we might ask, because suddenly yeah. those women are visible. And you can right. interrogate those questions. You know, you, you you can look at the state of their hands, the state of their shoes. You get a, you begin to be able to construct something about their experience as workers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that industry mm -hmm. that you could never ever get from any other historical source. And this is why I think you know this is what I mean by a, a think space that you know you interrogate those images in a certain way that bring the details of scale and attention to the historical mm -hmm. surface in a way that nothing else does. And this is why I argue in the book that, um, that Anna's reading at the moment, um, that in the, the presence of photographs changes the scale at 
at which we ask historical questions. I wouldn't say it's the only reason, you know, I would never claim mm. it's completely causal, but it's a major causal impact, I think. I mean, I think one of the things I argue in the book is the rise and rise of social history and micro history mm. happen in the, the mass photographic age. Certainly, I mean, there'd been social history before. I mean, there was interest in costume and all sorts of in the late 18th century and, you know, the, customs and so forth but you know that trajectory of analytical social history written at a micro scale emerges in the photographic age even if it's on the medieval Italy right somehow it changes yeah. our levels of attention yeah. actually is there is a, a wonderful a wonderful essay from uh, Kingsburg about the close-up it was published uh, in this book here, but it is this one here, but it's in Portuguese. Uh, you can manage just. Uh, I think it was. Uh, let's see the the title in in uh, the title in Il filo il letrasse vero falso e finito. Uh, mm. It's about uh, it's about uh, the close-up, and and he reads Krakauer through Benjamin. It's very interesting, and mm. he connects the practice of history, of micro history, with the idea of close-up. It's, yeah. it's yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting, and I, I I'd like to thank you so much. Yeah, I think we we'll have a. We we'll have a master class here from and, and now with the participation of John and Paulo and, and Luciana. Luciana had to 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 give class and and Marcos is listening, but he's driving to take the, his children uh, uh, from school. So I would like to thank you so much, Elizabeth, and to uh, I work on the translation of a, of your book. I think it's it's precious book. And uh, I think it will be uh, a, a present for us because you are an important reference for our studies. Your article that have been uh, translated, the performance of history, uh, it is open uh, for undergrad students that sometimes they don't have opportunity to read English. And uh, it is great uh, 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 because you went on the road for so many years and we are uh, no, and we are actually publicizing and translating what you were thinking through our uh, uh, work too. So I'd like to thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, Marcos. And uh, I give the word to Marcos Oliveira, who is the author of this wonderful book, who is in the shadow of colonialism, uh, photography, speculation, and the colonial uh, Portuguese project. It's in Portuguese, but it, uh, we will try to translate it somehow to, to English. Uh, but uh, I, I give the, the, the word to Marcos so he can wrap, wrap up our section. And thank you again for all the, the audience and for your generosity to give your time to us. It's so I, I, I'm, I'm, it's, uh, I, I feel so, so embraced by this. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you, Marcus and Paolo and John and Luciano, who's disappeared, and Marcus. <laughs> and uh, it's been just a delight to talk with you. It's just been wonderful. Thank you so much for your generosity and your brilliant ideas and comments. It's just been fabulous. Ah. Yeah. It's been very nice. I feel in the community of the like-minded. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 We'll, we'll keep in touch. Bye -bye. Yeah. <laughs> Give my love to Patricia, too. Okay? I will. I'll nice. have, a ni have a nice holiday. And take Bye -bye. care. Okay? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>